So happy to see my old time friend and mentor Stan Krippner here uh, a couple of weeks back. Um, yes, I am Janet Pitalato, and I seem to have lived many lives in this one life and have lived an enchanted life. I was born into a house where paranormal was normal. Um, my mom was a, an amazing seer and she was a dreamer. So for me to grow up in a home where afterlife communication, um, divination, um, communication through dreams was the norm, it began me on a road of always being interested in what was happening at night as opposed to what was happening during the day. And with a very vivid imagination as a child, those who know me know of my stories of literally sitting in the closet for most of my childhood summer vacations where I would tell my mother I was going somewhere. And little did I know, you know, I have, I have a drum these days and do shamanic work, um, which Stan knew well about a good 30 years ago. But I sat in that closet and had these amazing experiences, which compliments of my mom, I did realize that many of them were real, that I was traveling to real places, I was communicating with real people who during the period of my life, sometimes 20, 30 years later, I actually met and actually went. In fact, the place that you see behind me um, is an image of the great temple of Abydos in Egypt. And I first traveled there in dream. And I met an individual in dream who showed me some of the carvings on the wall of the temple. In a very special place, there was an image of a deity. And that deity was pouring onks over what appeared to be the Pharaoh, which was Seti I of the temple. And the dream continued. And in the dream, I traveled a causeway to what was an underground pool by the temple. Now, it wasn't until 30 years later that going to Egypt, um, I happened to be in a space by the Great Pyramid, one of the mortuary temples, and I asked my son to take a picture of a particular causeway. And the guardian who was there asked me why I was so interested in the causeway as opposed to everything else. And I said, well, you know what? I had it in a dream, and it just so reminds me of the dream I'd actually like an image. And she said to me, well, tell me more about this dream. And that particular dream I didn't think was real because I'd never heard of a temple that actually had a pool in the basement um, because that's exactly what it looked like. And when I described it, she said to me, oh my goodness, the temple is closed. It's been closed for many years, but the temple is a Bidos. Well, I had the great privilege at the turn of the millennium of actually going there. And when I arrived, the guardian at the gate, he reached his hand out to me and he said, welcome back, doctor. It's nice to see you again. Well, I'll tell you, when we go in dreams, not only do we travel to real places, but people actually see us. That was a completely out of the picture image of me as a little girl dreaming of a Bidos and then growing up to be an adult and seeing it. So that began a path which took me down a very strange alley of getting my first doctorate in science. I was very lucky to study under Dr. Floor Strand, who is a neurologist in New York University. But on my path there, as I was a pre-med student, I was even more fortunate in meeting Stanley and being able to balance both science and parapsychology at the same time. I was only 17 years old when I met Stan, and it happened quite by accident. I was in a college which was doing something very unusual at the time. They began what they called independent studies, and one student from each discipline would be represented in this very special honor seminar, and each one of us would be able to choose our own studies, our own whatever it is that we were most interested in. I chose parapsychology. And it just so happened that as I began my, my freshman year, there was a lecture in, in New York City in Fordham University. And this wonderful professor who was a, a doctor studying with Montague Ullman and doing research in Brooklyn on dreams happened to be speaking. And I happened to be able to attend that lecture. That lecturer was Dr. Stanley Krippner. 
at the end of it, I walked up to him, and this will tell you so much about Stan. I introduced myself. I said, I, I'm a student. I'm a pre-med student at this small college, but I'm doing independent study on parapsychology. I have $30 to offer you. Would you come and repeat your lecture at my college? Well, Stanley not only came, but he spoke to Dean Veach, who was the dean of my, my college, and decided to become my external mentor. For four years of college, Stanley was to introduce me to the big names that people hear about today. My first flight on an airplane was down to the Rhine Institute for the study on the nature of man. Now, J.B. Rhine and Louisa Rhine were foremost parapsychologists. In fact, J.B. Rhine is con kind of considered the father of parapsychology. He began in physiology, interestingly enough, because that was my major as, as a, a, a biology student. I was majoring in physiology. And yet he was interested in the paranormal. He was interested in the hidden depths of the psyche and opened up the Rhine Institute, which is still, I believe, run by his daughter, the, the present day. But I traveled not once, but several times um, to study down at the Institute to be part of the research that was done. There was research with the Russians at the time done on parapsycho um, parapsychology as far as thinking, thinking experiments where we used the Rhine cards, which most of you are probably familiar with. They were cards with different images, and we were to sit there and to predict which card would come up. And it actually was at this space that I met another young researcher who was a parapsychologist at the time. And it was Dr. Bob Breyer, who is also a lifetime friend of mine, and he is presently an Egyptologist of some renown. He does a lot of the discovery channels, bringing people into Egypt, and teaches hieroglyphs, which is something I studied with Bob. But Bob was down at the Institute, and they were interested in the relationship with people and plants. You know, we look at this universe, we look at the planet, and we look at how, how do individuals look at the land. You know, we're poisoning the land, we're putting pesticides in it, we're treating the plants as though they don't have a consciousness, and yet they do. And certainly some of the mythologies of the world show that the plants probably had the first consciousness. Well, here at the Rhine Institute, we actually studied our effect on our mental thoughts influencing a plant. I can remember sitting there, now mind you, I'm, I'm a freshman when I began, and I'm sitting in front of a plant, and I'm sending the plant healing so that it would grow more quickly. Well, there were all sorts of electrodes on the plant that showed, in fact, when I would project something positive, that plant would be able to grow. And that's not all that happened down there. I remember Theodore Ritzel, who was a, an authority on past life regression. I, I remember Hans Holzer, the great ghost hunter. This, this was a gathering place for people. Eileen Garrett, everyone was interested to understand a little bit better the extent of consciousness, because that's really what it is. Consciousness is non-local. And there, as a 17-year-old, with a background in my own personal experiences that was pushing me on to understand better the dreams that my own mother was able to have, the dreams that had come to me. Through Stanley, through this place with the J.B. Ryan Institute, my mind opened up to trying to understand better what was my consciousness about, what was really happening, and what is the extent of human consciousness in really awakening us to not only look at the planet in a different way, but look at ourselves and all of the cosmos as something beyond the physical. So if you can imagine, I'm studying this, and on the other hand, I'm doing my physiology lab, I'm doing all of the work that, that's involved with a student who's getting a pre-med degree and applying eventually to get a doctoral degree in science because I wanted my grounding. And Stan is responsible to have me go on a seance. So you can only imagine in the movies we have a seance on the wet afternoon. And I am being sent into the city, paid for by my university, 
for a, a, a medium who was tutored on TV everywhere, on the Alan Burke show, and certainly in Hollywood, where she was the prime medium of the day. Unfortunately, today, there's not much about her online. You'll see a little bit with Hans Holzer, because Hans Holzer often sat with her while she went into trance, and her trance connection was through her deceased husband. But I'll never forget the day that Stanley orchestrated my going into the city and being part of my first seance. I was met by an individual from the New York Times because this was going to be promoted in the newspaper. And he, his name was Bob Nelson. Apparently his brother was a medium, a natural medium, and they were twins. And Bob was very interested in mediumship because his brother was a natural and he apparently did not have the gift. Well, we entered into a conservatory in the East 70s and we were greeted by this lovely woman Ethel Johnson Myers. You can only imagine that evening. I've, I, I'm writing a novel, actually. The novel was written long ago, and I'm working on it again. But I have the scene because the scene is perfect for a movie. We have operatic music that's streaming in through the open window. The whole building is a conservatory. And Ethel Johnson Myers actually taught music. This was her formal day job, while mediumship was what she did at night. And we sat there, not a round table, not with our hands joined, but with a great big horn in the middle of the room. And Ethel explained to us that sometimes poltergeists, mischievous spirits, might want to come while she's in trance. And this wonderful apparatus in the middle of the room would collect those spirits. Now, I should back up a little to say, well, I believed in mediumship. My grandfather indeed appeared to me at, at age four when he passed away. I was holding his hand, my mom brought me home, and lo and behold, he was seated on my bed waiting to talk to me. So there was not a question that I didn't believe in mediumship, but I didn't understand why a, a deceased spirit would not come directly to the individual that they wanted to see. Why go through Ethel? And, and again, my family was such that the paranormal was so common in my home, it never dawned on me that most people might not be capable of having a direct visit. So I went on this visit to Ethel Johnson Myers, trying to show that if in fact she got anyone, she got it perhaps through mental telepathy. If I was thinking about someone who had passed away or thinking about someone I made up, perhaps that was her connection. So, deviously, I made up a person. Uh, it was a male, he was a certain age, he had a certain job, there were things that he liked, and everything was placed in an envelope. I had another student with me from the Honest Seminar, and she was given the same individual information to concentrate on. In other words, the two of us would be so concentrated on my fictitious man, and I was expecting Ethel, therefore, to pick it up by mental telepathy, and then I would prove that she was a great psychic, but she hadn't really seen anybody from the other side. The New York Times reporter, by the way, had, had with him a glove from his grandfather because his grandfather was, as I said, the connection to his brother, who was the medium. So we're sitting here in this room. It's dusk. The music is coming into the room, and Ethel is sitting there with a crystal on her neck. And she's moving that crystal as she's telling us the story of her life. It was very normal. She had never seen anything until her husband passed. And then in great grief, she'd wanted to commit suicide. And that was the time that her husband appeared to her and said she needed to be a medium. She needed to show people that there was no reason to grieve because in fact, there was no death. So this story is very nicely playing out as the room is becoming more and more in shadow. We're seated in our own individual chairs. We're not holding hands. But suddenly, Ethel is different. She's gone into trance. That movement back and fro, back and fro, has done its job, and she's in an altered state. She begins to describe two individuals, a male and a female. I pay no attention to what she's describing because, in fact, I'm paying attention to my envelope. 
I'm thinking, well, it's certainly not, it's not the one in the envelope, so perhaps this is someone for Bob, the reporter from the Times, or maybe it's someone else in the room. I, I wasn't sure. And then suddenly she said, well, no one is recognizing, um, you know, no one, is, no one is recognizing who's here. I should ask them their names. And she comes out with their names, which were Rocco and Georgiana. Now, these names to me are pretty stunning. It's not like John and Mary or Anne or a more common name. These were the names of my grandparents. Well, suddenly I was interested in what she had to say. She gave me information beyond anything I could know, almost as though the grandparents were saying, you're skeptical, you're not going to believe, so we're going to have to give you information that you have to validate elsewhere. It's not coming from your brain, it's going through somewhere else. And indeed, it wasn't until I went home and spoke to my mom that I was given the information, the correctness of that information and the validity. Ethel Johnson Myers was the real deal. I went back to her many times. Um, Stanley was magnificent in opening up all the doors for me, and I brought many other people to her. And the one thing really about her was not only her authenticity, but her honesty in letting us know it was not an open door. The mediumship happened, yes, but sometimes it just didn't. It didn't work. And there were people I brought that she needed to say this was not a day for connection. Either there was something wrong in the reception or our misunderstanding of exactly how it worked. But Ethel opened my eyes to understand far more than what I understood as a small child. As I moved on through life, I did continue and certainly attained my doctorate in anatomy and physiology at, at, from New York University. And I went on to have my children. But I always kept a connection with Stanley. And that was what was really interesting because after all those years, after the connection with the, the degree and the family growing, we reconnect with Stanley inviting me to do a second doctoral degree in transpersonal psychology. It was time for me to join the two parts of my psyche. The one that was rational and skeptical, which as Stan will tell me to this day, is very important in keeping balance and keeping an open mind. And those of us that were here for Stanley's talk, when Stanley presented that very interesting series of dreams, he spoke to me about that last year. And his open-mindedness was wonderful because on one hand was the balance that said, it may be fraud and it may be something else. It may have been transmitted in another way other than the other world. Let's face it, the gentleman in question that was being the intermediary, the one who actually knew the names and was able to source them because he was in Afghanistan, was the woman sourcing something through the non-locality of consciousness? Or had those beings actually come and given messages from the afterlife? Keeping everything open is very important because we know there is afterlife connection. I mean, I can say to you 100% there is connection, but not everything that reaches our door is so. And by Stanley's open-mindedness to accept when it happens and when it doesn't really is the big difference in the picture. And I have to thank him gratefully for that because when my first degree did give me the grounding in the science my background in my own personal experiences certainly opened me, I mean, in this very temple, to have it all validated that it was something I saw. But even to have those who passed away show up, I can remember working with Stan and explaining some of the visions that I had, some of the work with the afterlife, that as Stanley would say to me, it's, it would have to be super psi, which in parapsychology means our mind and consciousness has to cross too many wires to believe that something would come in such an extraordinary manner. It's easier to believe that it made one leap to some consciousness that exists without the body. And of course, when we started to talk about even remote vision of going places in dream, 
and being in one place, for instance, sitting at my computer as I am now, and telling Stanley, but I know I was in Egypt. I know what I saw, and I have a friend that's there. I saw her at the temple. I saw that individual fall in her group. I gave her a call. I described the individual. It happened. What is that showing us about consciousness? And it's showing us that we're connected to a physical body now. But what Stan was really showing me was that we have to be open to try to understand how do we exist outside of this body. The body still is alive while I'm having the experiences, but I seem not to be, not to be connected with it the same way as a near-death experience is. So all along the way, you know, Stan sent me then into the city and in Manhattan, Carlos Osis, big name for the American Psychical Society, to meet him, to be part of those lectures, but always to be doing the research, to be looking and searching, to find out who I was, but to understand better these experiences and to understand when they're real so that we can give them the honor that they really need. Um, my background in it was amazing and most people don't expect to see someone in pure science end up being in parapsychology as well. And so under, certainly under Stanley's um, mentorship, I did enter into the second degree in uh, transpersonal psychology and was very fortunate again because it was William James Scala um, from Harvard University that I, I had as the chair of my, my degree on the imaginal, on the transcendence of dreams and the language of dreams, um, Eugene Taylor, who has since passed on. So I just seem to have been in that enchanted place of being born into a home where dreaming, in fact, my birth was announced by a dream. Um, my mother always had the Taylor who showed up in the first trimester when she was pregnant. My mom was a designer and an artist, and so she knew the tailor was sewing pants, and she was gonna have a little boy. And three little boys came along before I did. And my birth was announced by the absence of the tailor. He did not show up in my mom's dreams in the first three months. And thus it was pronounced that I would be a girl to the point that my mother made a rag doll and gave it to my brothers and call that rag doll Janet. And the mystery got even greater because on the day of my arrival home, the rag doll disappeared. And it wasn't until I was about three or four, hearing the story over and again, I solved the mystery that they could not understand. And I, as a little girl, couldn't understand how adults didn't get it. I was the doll that came alive. So the mythology of my life, starting with that dream story, continues to this day. Um, as I still work in that dream world and know that the dream is what's important. You know, I think of Carl Jung who was saying, you know, you look in the outside world and that's really when you're asleep. But when you're asleep, or I like to say, when you're in the altered state, because I like to extend the dream and the altered state experience to that which a medium might have uh, in a trance state the a waking dream that I do in active imagination with people, the shamanic journey with the monotonous drumming, or even the chanting that's done to bring us into that state of focusing inward. This is where the truth lays. This is where we really find out who we are. So this is a little bit about me and my background. I've gone to Egypt many times, and I've gone to the UK, um, validating places and dreams. Um, these, these dreams were very real and had great meaning to me. Um, that's what the dream is about, is to give us meaning in our life. And as I said, I'm in an enchanted position because I got to study with some of the best, some of the greatest that most people today only read about. I mean, Stanley was just here last year. He was planning on coming back again because he's on certainly on the West Coast and I'm on the East Coast. Um, we're in constant connection with each other because that's what dreams do. And I mean, a dream group like this, I'm delighted to be part of. And Wendy had asked me to just share a little bit of my background. So that's where I came from. And where I am right now is writing about dreams, teaching about dreams, and private therapy with dreams. So
Okay, um, most of my work, as I said, I'm, I'm really interested in the altered state. And when we, when we deal with dreams and a dream state, we're altering our state of consciousness and getting into what I call an imaginal world. In fact, I like to call it entering the imaginal. And on Tuesday nights, it starts at 6 o'clock Eastern time. I do drumming with people, and I bring people into the altered state they see things because when we go in and we focus inwardly, the language of transcendence is the language of image. The image is calm. We're not hearing things so much. Some people do, but most of it is the, the language of a some sort of an image and a person is appearing, things are appearing, and then we're meant to work with it. It's uh, in fact the on Tuesday nights I usually start out in Delphi. We bring we go as pilgrims to an ancient site and that ancient site always began with what was written on a lentil which said know thyself interestingly enough people went with their own questions and it was only done a couple of days a year this was not expected every day and most of the people who went were high up they were they were wealthy they were privileged they were royalty and the answers that they got were always in riddles they always had to work them out well, know thyself, yes. They had to find their own answers, and how interesting. They traveled all the way to the ancient Pythia in order to find an answer to a question that they were going to solve. I try to teach that in entering the imaginal, in moving on that landscape to go in to try to understand what are the images trying to tell you. And in fact, I have a, a tarot deck out that was extremely successful as it came out. It was a bestseller. But I, I mention it because the images that came to me in dream are on the cards. And my explanation to people with using those cards is very much like going into any dream and going into a shamanic journey. Because when we journey shamanically, we're going to see things. And sometimes, like my visions of seeing Abydos behind me, Yes, it's real, and it was meant to show me the extent of consciousness that was non-local. It was not drawing from my own mental landscape. In other words, everything we see and do in our life is recorded. Even if our focus is on one particular thing, we don't realize. It's as though there's a camera inside picking up all the excess noise, all that's around the peripheral vision. But we have a system that we focus, even outwardly, only on certain things. When we go into an altered state, most of what rises, rises from those memories. So those memories are firm, even if, in fact, we maybe are not consciously aware of them. But beyond that is that territory that William James would call the corners of the room beyond the shining chandelier. They're not part of our personal mythology inside. It's not part of what we remember. And certainly Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. It's part of everything. And we are capable of moving there, but how do we understand the meaning? And what I'll tell people is there's a, a meaning that comes immediately of what we actually perceive. And that may or may not be the truth of the dream, the same way as the very famous story of those who went to the oracle at Delphi and were told that God was going to be on the field tomorrow for their fight. And they immediately left and took it as God is going to be on the field for us, we're going to win. And I believe the Pythia said, and a great empire will fall. Well, she was referring to their empire, but they weren't understanding that because they weren't willing to go in and see a little further. So when we, when I go in on my Tuesday night and on my classes, um, I'm teaching people to look perceptually about what they're seeing initially. What is the apparent vision immediately saying? And then look at that and say, what would anyone say this means? So that if I were to pick up, I have a card in my deck that's an onion. And I often use that because it's a perfect example. If I was to see an onion in a dream or in a shamanic journey, if that's the message for me, how do I interpret it? Well, 
first of all, we recognize it for what it is. It's an onion. It's a root vegetable. Fine. It may be red. It may be purple. It may be white. It may be yellow. Okay, we're getting into colors. Colors may mean something to us. We may cut that onion open and suddenly we have tears. It was something for culinary. Well, then we could have something that's caramelized and sweet. But as we begin to look at it, we may think, oh, I remember something. I remember a beautiful onion tart. And I remember that dinner specifically because at that dinner, I was given an award for something. Well, now all of a sudden the dream has gone from something very general, something that anybody can think about to something very specific in ourself. And then we may move even further. I remember I was at Arthur Finley and I was speaking to one young woman and I happened to pull that card for her. And lo and behold, the onion became an apple for me. In other words, I'm looking at an onion, but my mind brought up the image of an apple in the hand of the wicked stepmother in the fairy tale of, of Sleeping Beauty. I suddenly um, looked at the woman, so you understand what I'm saying. I'm getting a myth that's coming from my vision. I'm allowing something to come forth. And I said to the woman, I, I, you know, I, I think you probably had a problem with your youth. You probably had to leave and find a safe place, a safe haven. There was something threatening at home. It was 100% right on. She had to leave. But what I'm saying is if we are free, what I teach within the altered state is the image is the message. But often it's not the manifest image that we get initially. I really would like to remember my dreams. I set intention before I go to sleep. I have a pad and pencil out and I don't remember. I still can't remember my dreams. So rarely do I remember a dream. How can I help myself to remember dreams? Okay. Um, do you do any type of shamanic work during the day or active imagination or um, any type of meditation that would get you into imagery, even, even uh, you know, an imaginal journey where someone is leading you somewhere? Do you do any, any type of work like that during the day? Um, I am a medium, um, okay. and I do, I do shamanic drumming. Um, I'm not really a, uh, a meditation person. I, I connect with mother earth that's in the forest. That's my connection. Okay. But when you do your shamanic journeying, mm -hmm. um, do you have very vivid images that arise? No more. Um, a centering and a connection feeling. Okay. Um, I have, I see orbs when they're, when I'm drumming. Okay. Um, normally the reason I ask that is for the, because the more shamanic journeying someone does and the more that they actually connect to another landscape, in other words, focusing inwardly, you see yourself entering a landscape, you start to see and feel and smell and hear everything around you like you're on a real landscape that often follows with dreams that start to be much more vivid and increase if that's not the case what i would what i would ask you to do right now is before you go to bed yes you have that pen and pa paper and everything there um do you also make an intention of what you might like to dream about i just asked to try to remember my dream just to um, remember okay yeah. um I, I like to put down some sort of an intention as well and okay. say I would like to dream about someone or I, I have a issue that I'm trying to work through during the day and bring it up because the dream will bring it up in a very creative way, which is often better than what the constraints of waking reality. But I also will make the intention that I want to dream and it sounds a little crazy, but when I'm dreaming, I want to be able to notice I'm dreaming and with me it usually means I want suddenly to be holding a candle and then I will wake up. Now if in fact you have something that you'd like to say well I want to, my, my little rock or my little crystal or whatever it is I have um, 
help me in this dream so that I know I can move along um, by letting me remember my specific amulet that I want to come in the dream. That's a help. What's also a help, most of us have our most memorable dreams right before, about an hour before we wake up in the morning. So put your timer on for about an hour before you wake and let the timer gently, some sort of chimes or whatever to wake you up and be very still and very quiet. Even if you think you're not remembering, make yourself sit up and begin to write, I had a dream, I was, and you start telling a story, and what we call amnemnesis occurs. Suddenly, in your beginning to write, something is going to awake the memory of something else. If it doesn't, put the pencil down, put the paper down, put your head back on the pillow, and try to sleep another half hour or so with the timer on again. Usually, this helps people remember because we do have four or five dreams a night, but it is often right before we wake that we'll have the most important one. And if you can, when you're journeying, try to find yourself on, and I mean, you're welcome to join at six o'clock Eastern time, United States on Tuesday nights, but try, try to join a particular landscape. Uh, I actually start my group in a landscape. I studied with Michael Harner, for, I was with him for five years, and that was another of Stanley's introduction, which was quite wonderful. I can't remember all of them to, to share with you. Um, but one of the things that, that we did after we already knew how to journey is we could journey from a space that was comfortable for us. So you went out camping. If there's a place in camping by the water or by a tree, that you feel is very sacred to yourself, as you journey with your drum, bring yourself in your mind to remember that space beneath the tree or by the water. And imagine yourself either going into the water to have your experience or climbing up the tree to have your experience. But the more that you seek the imaginal world, and imaginal really refers to the power of the faculty of the imagination to form mental images, which helps you to focus inwardly. Because if you're just seeing orbs, um, you're, not getting, you're not getting the language of the other side. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how you connect with your medium abilities, but normally it's the images that speak. That's the language of the transcendence. So the more that you can connect and understand that language, the more fluent you become. You become a better dreamer and then you'll also be a medium at night. I mean, some of my best connections have been made at night um, and they, you know, they, they embody you, they're so real.